morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pai from uh, uh, CB10X Venture Capital team. Uh, I'm thrilled to be my guest speaker today, Olaf Carson Wee, the founder and CIO of Polychain Capital. Hi, Olaf. Hey, thanks for having me. Hi. I think before we delve into the topic today, uh, uh, can you briefly share us a bit about your journey? Because I think it's very unique that you were the first employee at Coinbase and now running the most reputable uh, venture capital investing in digital assets. Could you briefly share with us how you got started um, and what led you to the success of Polychain today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was going into my undergraduate uh, senior year of studies um, this was in 2011 and found out about Bitcoin. Um, I immediately sort of fell down the veritable rabbit hole and became immediately interested in this concept of cryptocurrency. So I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Bitcoin. So this was sort of an academic research paper, um, you know, back when this was basically just an open source software project, more than it was an industry the way we would think about it today. Um, I joined Coinbase as the first employee. Um, this was at a sort of pre-Series A stage. It was a very young company just operating out of a residential apartment in San Francisco. Um, was there as the head of risk for about three and a half years and then left to launch Polychain. Um, and with Polychain, I think one of the really interesting things that we do is make venture style investments directly into digital assets. So rather than owning equity of private startups, uh, the way a traditional venture investor might, we really invest directly into digital assets um, and have a very participatory approach. So we take um, you know, participation in the peer-to-peer -peer systems in which we're investors very seriously. I see, what's a, what's a remark journey? Because you, you, you were right there at the very beginning of the industry. And let's just get into talk about the DeFi trends. Um, um, since I'm sure you've seen a lot of deal flows and what, what are the exciting trends you see in blockchain, especially in decentralized finance today? Yeah, so right now um, we've really seen the, the sort of growth of a lot of building blocks that people have worked on for years. Um, we saw people work on things like stable coins and other synthetic assets pegged, pegged to external price feeds, um, decentralized exchanges, um, and lending systems, all of these sort of underlying components add up to these more advanced financial applications that can be in, embedded in blockchains like Ethereum. So um, DeFi today has really, you know, in 2020 gone through this explosive growth, but it's been the result of hard work behind the scenes for many years. And it's really only in 2020 that all those pieces came together um, to really define this like larger whole subsector of the cryptocurrency industry, which is DeFi. Um, so I think DeFi is really fascinating for a number of reasons that are somewhat obvious. Um, you know, it allows any two parties in the entire world, no matter who they are or where they are, to enter into an arbitrarily complex business arrangement. Um, this includes, for example, two computers um, could enter into such arrangement. Um, and so I think that when we look at um, the growth in DeFi in 2020, um, some of this can be ascribed to also really novel financially, um, financial engineering. So this concept of network mining or liquidity mining, whereby the early participants in a system actually become owners of that system um, is a really new idea that's sort of only possible with blockchains. So this idea that you can actually incentivize the signup of new, new users by granting them a partial ownership stake in the uh, system in which they're providing value is a very interesting concept. It's sort of like uh, rewarding early I think we lost all of um, policy for the technical issue here. Uh, 
Um, perhaps while waiting for Olaf, I think we we can um, let's briefly. I would like to share you briefly what um, we look at at 10A for investment. Um, we are the corporate venture capital arm of uh, Sam Commercial Bank, so I think we look into um, fintech area, especially in this and finance and blockchain. And also aside from fintech, we also um, look at other related pillars like um, digital health, digital lifestyle. Um, and kind of deep tech area in order to um, provide a better uh, financial service in the future. Um, so I think the, the reasons, um, I think we, we arranged these D5 sessions because we, we thought about a lot of um, education needs in the industry and we hope uh, that we can be part of it. Um, I think Olaf is not back yet. Uh, a bit more about 10X. Uh, we have three main units, uh, Venture Capital, which is um, my team. And then we have um, Strategic Partnership and Investment, who look for maybe a more mature um, late stage um, technology companies that want to expand the Thai market and partner with us. Um, and also, we also have Venture Building Team, uh, which can kind of ideation of any um, interesting models and try to expand. I will just pause a bit here and wait for Olaf. He's waiting. Maybe we can go from there. Yeah. Um, so this whole concept of sort of network mining or liquidity mining allows people to rapidly um, and so I think that it it I think allows for the sort of fastest growth of network effects um, that we've ever really seen in sort of any sort of area of the internet. Um, and what I mean by network effects specifically is whereby the incremental value for a user is based primarily not on the platform, platform or protocol itself uh, per se, but rather uh, the number of other users in that system. And so liquidity in a, in a decentralized exchange order book or liquidity in a lending service are great examples of this. And I think, um, you know, we really have seen the ability to bootstrap network effects in these sort of systems faster than ever before by using this sort of method of network mining or liquidity mining. And so uh, DeFi today, you know, in, in 2020 has gone through this explosive growth that I think is the result of a lot of work of previous years. Uh, but I do think it's very much early days. We're going to see a lot of experimentation going into 2021. And even with the current cryptocurrency market size, which is a relatively modest $500 billion, um, I think that DeFi, you know, could grow in terms of the amount of value held in these systems by about 10 times. Um, I do expect the value held in all of cryptocurrency to, to also grow substantially, which makes the growing room for DeFi uh, today um, closer to, say, 50 or 100 times. Um, so it's a very exciting to area, area to be building in. Um, and I think most of, you know, what's going to happen here is ahead of us, not behind us. Mm, yeah, that, that's interesting to see the, the volume increase significantly this year. And I think, but this, despite all the, the volume we, we see and the innovation we have today, 
I think there's still a lot of um, limitations that kind of the limit growth of the DeFi today. For example, it's not that um, user friendly, it's quite difficult to use. And I think somewhat limited product market fit. Um, what, what are your thoughts on these limitations or, or other limitations that you see? And how do you think DeFi should be improved or evolved in the next five years to kind of cross the chasm? Yep, so I think there are two uh, primary blockers for DeFi reaching sort of uh, effectively mainstream users today. One is um, very difficult user experience. So uh, what we need are effective abstractions for end users. So they don't need to think about uh, cryptographic keys. They don't need to think about gas fees or transactional fees. Um, they don't need to download third-party software like MetaMask to interact with these systems. Um, today, these systems sort of expose the nuts and bolts of the underlying architecture. Um, but a really successful product actually abstracts away all of that complexity and just shows the end user you know, the very simple um, um, benefits for them without them having to understand all the complicated, you know, stuff happening under the hood. And so I think uh, better abstractions at the UX layer is the first uh, very big one. Uh, the second really big one is scalability of these underlying systems. Um, so this is really an R&D, like research and engineering problem. And it's, you know, how do we actually, um, um, allow developers to build more expressive uh, behaviors inside smart contracts and also for the simpler behaviors, how do we allow them to be very high value, very high throughput. Um, and so there are a lot of different scaling approaches being attempted right now. Um, layer two on Ethereum, um, you know, is, is things, you know, there's a half a dozen different approaches here. You have um, optimistic rollups, CK rollups. Um, you know, different startups like Starkware, Matter, and Matic, all working on, on different approaches. Um, so I do think that, you know, it's, we're very far from knowing what, you know, everyone is going to sort of coalesce on. There are network effects around those various layer two scalability solutions. So I do expect there will be some amount of magnetism towards, you know, a relatively unified uh, DeFi, uh, uh, you know, scaling plan. Um, and then, of course, we have alternative layer one systems. So these are things like, uh, for example, Polkadot and Definity and Avalanche uh, that, you know, simply have better scalability at the low level than Ethereum does. And um, you're going to see not only people build on those new layer ones, I think you'll see people fork those layer ones. I think we'll see DeFi apps move to their own application specific blockchains. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of different approaches to scalability, uh, but that is, and it's, it's very, we're in a very much a chaotic era when it comes to, you know, being able to predict how this scalability um, engineering will work out. Um, but I think that um, these are the two main friction points are basically UX and underlying scalability. Mm, got it. Since then you touch on um, different protocols here. I think if, if maybe advice to entrepreneurs that listen to our session today, how should they think about like when, when which protocol they should build upon on top? Yeah, I mean, that's actually a very, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs about that. Um, I think probably the safest approach today um, is if you wanna just ship really fast, it's just to ship on Ethereum. Um, the existing user base and, and liquidity and, and primitives are all on Ethereum today. Um, if you can find product market fit on Ethereum, um, which is tricky because you're actually competing with, um, you know, many different applications and, and, and many different other types of assets, um, then as a scalability approach, you can start to consider both layer two approaches on Ethereum as well as alternative layer ones. But I, I, I think that finding product market fit is critical before trying to do too much work on the R&D level on scalability. Like solving scalability is, is quite complex and difficult. And if you solve scalability for something that doesn't have product market fit, it's a useless exercise. Mm -hmm. um, so putting those resources towards scalability before you have product market fit, I think doesn't make any sense. Got it. 
I think it's exciting to see how DeFi is going to solve these these two issues, like the the user friendliness and the the um, scalability. And I think um, it's kind of when you when I hear you talk about the future of DeFi, it's kind of huge um, pose a threat to the centralized finance we know today. And I think I think not only um, to the traditional bank like us, but also I think the DeFi in in the industry like centralized exchange. Um, how do you think it will play out? Like, will we see the the DeFi start moving to DeFi? Yeah, I mean, by nature of these DeFi systems, you can't really own one per se. Um, so having for-profit businesses move into um, decentralized systems is quite tr tricky. Um, it's it's not like other types of, of um, business strategies. So um, I do think you'll see businesses fully decentralize themselves and convert from pen and paper legal entities into uh, DAOs or like decentralized organizations where they effectively turn their cap table of equity into uh, tokens that are defined on chain. So I do think um, you will see this conversion from, you know, for-profit entities operating sort of fintech style businesses. Um, you know, I, I think you'll see those types of businesses basically um, move to an on-chain uh, system, sort of the way you saw compound finance, for example, start as a, as a venture funded startup and move towards a fully programmatic on-chain system. Um, but it's going to be very hard for CFI, you know, set, you know, these set traditional financial incumbents, um, whether they're crypto exchanges or otherwise, um, to sort of own, you know, a, a DeFi asset, if that makes sense. Like, it's hard to just sort of own a DEX and own your centralized exchange. It, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, so for, by the, for this very reason, I think it's quite tricky for incumbents to deal with uh, the phenomenon of DeFi. Yeah, they think it's, it's a lot that the traditional banks need to think how to deal with this space. And I think maybe the better way, maybe just to start DeFi without moving anything from DeFi and, and clear the concept of control. Um, since you touch a bit on the, the, the DAO or decentralized autonomous organization, which are behind uh, most of the decentralized applications um, today, and I think they are quite unique that DAO is actually the organization that runs by code embedded in the smart contract. And, and perhaps can you share with us a bit on what do you see, like, like, like what's the blockchain impact on the decentralized organization and what are the unique aspects? Because it's totally different from the traditional corporate we know today. Yeah, so people have talked about DAOs for a really long time and DAOs are really only possible with blockchains. This ability to replace pen and paper um, legal contracts that define corporate relationships where you have a huge group of people that coordinate capital and can make decisions about how to allocate that capital. Um, you know, you couldn't really do that outside of a legal apparatus until blockchains. And you replace that whole pen and paper legal system with a on-chain pure software system. Now, these DAOs have always been really conceptually interesting to me. Um, but we never really found product market fit for DAOs until DeFi. Um, so, you know, it, originally these DAOs were mostly thought of sort of as like venture funds, where you could almost imagine the, the DAO structure was somewhat conceptually similar to the general partnership of a fund, where they would actually raise capital and then allocate that to investments. Now, though, with the advent of DeFi and these, these kind of on-chain financial products, you have DAOs that sort of uh, manage and accrue revenues from that underlying uh, smart contract system that's embedded inside the blockchain. And so these DAOs um, finally have product market fit. We have multiple you know, billion dollar DAOs out there today. Um, pretty much every single one of these was launched in the last year. So we really are entering a sort of golden era of DAOs in my view. Um, and we finally have the on-chain businesses that these DAOs can own and operate. And so I think these um, DAOs are going to get much, much bigger than they already are. 
Um, and a lot more value is going to be managed by these uh, DAO-like organizational structures because they really do uh, represent a completely novel way to organize humans and capital, much in the way that corporate structures themselves um, represented new ways to organize humans and capital. So um, the other thing about these DAO assets, like tokens that represent ownership stakes in DAOs, is that to me they really represent the second major asset class um, you know, of cryptocurrency. So before this, you had very traditional cryptocurrencies, and these are things like Bitcoin, things like Ethereum. Um, these DAOs have real cash flows, and they have products that they sponsor that are not the DAO itself. Um, so you could view Bitcoin, for example, as one big DAO, but in that case, the cap table and the product are the same thing. So the distributed ownership of the Bitcoins, you know, thus the sort of cap table, kind of is the product in itself. It's hard to divorce those two concepts. In the case of a DAO, though, um, there's sort of a cap table that manages and, and owns revenues from an underlying product, and then that product is a little bit separate. It's, it sort of um, can be used by people that really don't care about the DAO that's managing it. Um, and so I think that you know we really have, with these cash flow generating DAOs, the second major asset class on blockchains. Uh, the first one being these proper cryptocurrencies. And so I do view DAOs and DAO tokens as just a massive breakthrough and um, something that, you know, despite the precipitous growth in 2020, I think it's incredibly nascent still. Mm, maybe um, what, what are the limitations of the DAO you see today? Um, so these, I think the main one is enforcing real world legal contracts. So um, DAOs are really good at um, doing business with other DAOs. So DAOs can move money on, on uh, decentralized exchanges. DAOs can uh, put money into um, an on-chain lending pool. But DAOs are not very good at, say, leasing real estate. The reason is, like, literally who signs the legal contract. <laughs> um, and I do think that there's going to be very interesting solutions. For example, DAOs using a big multi-signature to cryptographically sign legal contracts. I think it is possible. Um, and DAOs can, afford, of course, disperse payments. So DAOs could pay law firms um, to enforce contracts for them, for example. I think we're going to get into that world slowly, where DAOs have to interact with sort of meat space. But um, today, it's, it's by far the biggest open question is basically how will DAOs interact with real-world legal entities and legal apparatuses. Mm, got it. Yeah, I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, I think now we kind of hear your thoughts on the, the blockchain impact to the financial service and the decentralized organization or DAO. Maybe um, I would like to touch on a broader topic. What's the blockchain impact to the, the new uh, internet uh, evolution or the Web 3.0? Uh, in your view? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these, um, what we think of as DeFi are, are basically just mathematical operations embedded in a system like Ethereum. Um, the vision for Web3 is, you know, much more expressive, um, um, you know, interactive applications. So things like um, video streaming, um, images and text, uh, user profiles, um, all of the sorts of things that we enjoy on very rich web experiences are not really in scope of blockchains today. Um, the main reason being that we just don't have the appropriate um, technology, right? The scaling is not there. Um, the appropriate user abstractions are not there. Uh, the, the user bases are not there. So we need many, many more millions of users to make these business models really viable. Um, but we will get there, and just in the way that DAOs found product market fit around these DeFi applications, I do think that we're going to see DAOs own and operate more traditional web-like applications. So you'll see DAOs own social media applications. Uh, DAOs will own things like Dropbox. Um, you know, I, I think that, and that will be probably an application built on, on Filecoin, for example, so I do think that we are moving towards a world where these DAOs can basically sponsor, create, and accrue revenues from much more 
um, immersive applications, not just kind of financial ones. Um, and I think that we have the strong tailwind of all the scalability technology that allows uh, smart contracts to interact with images, and text, and video. But until we have those uh, more basic building blocks, um, you know, we can't expect mass consumer applications to come out. So I do think that scalability technologies have to come first, um, and then we're going to see, you know, the proliferation of, you know, not liquidity mining for an order book, for example, but perhaps um, like like post mining for a social media application, where you can actually earn earn um, block rewards for participation in a social media network, for example. Um, this is the sort of thing that's uniquely possible with blockchains, and I do think that DAOs are well positioned to be the organizational and capital structure that really capitalizes on these new Web3 uh, technology applications. Yeah, I think that's, that's very interesting to see, like, uh, I think we are running out of time, but thank you so much, Olaf. I think today we, we, we hear your thoughts on the, the DeFi, the DAO, and the blockchain impact, and especially beyond the financial service. I think that's very interesting to see. And thank you so much for being with us today, and, and we hope to have you again in the next event.